Well, good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar brought to, brought to you by University of Illinois Extension's Local Government Education Program. My name is Nancy Wadrago. I'm with the University of Illinois Extension and we are happy to be hosting this series on attracting rural residents. All information on archived videos and upcoming webinars can be found on our Illinois Extension Local Government Education site at go.illinois.edu slash LGE. And I will include that link also in the chat as well. Now I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Norman Walzer. Dr. Walzer has been involved in rural development efforts for many years in Illinois and is connected to all of today's collaborating partners and will moderate this session as well as the Q&A at the end of the presentation. Norm, thank you so much for being here and I will pass it on to you now. Thank you, Nancy and Mike and Ann and all the others who have spent time putting together these, these webinars. I think they've really been a major contribution and probably one of the few positive things that actually came out of the COVID situation where the telecommunication advances have really allowed us to, to do these kinds of things or maybe stimulated us to do them is a better word. Uh, as Nancy mentioned, the um, this set of programs really came out of uh, some discussions with rural partners where we were interested in, in doing some things that basically would cause some action items to occur in some communities. And so as we were looking around, we wanted to figure out how do we you know, involve the, the various rural partners agencies as well in a collaborative sort of way, as well as address some issues that we knew many rural areas needed to, or rural communities needed to deal with. So extension, rural partners, the Institute for Rural Affairs, Illinois Farm Bureau, Governor's Rural Affairs Council, and Association of Rural and Small Illinois Schools are really the ones who put this together and, and you know, we're trying to, um, to follow up at the end of these three or four programs. And we'll take a look at that point to see if there's additional thing, if there are additional things that need to be done or, uh, or how we can continue to help. But the ultimate goal here is to really have the, the participating communities set up some sort of a recruiting program or action plan or whatever it is to make it um, to make some things happen and make their life better. So as Nancy mentioned, I've worked with the Institute for Rural Affairs and Rural Partners and Governor's Rural Affairs Council and just a lot of agencies almost from the beginning. And I've been uh, responsible for um, kind of helping to organize the annual conference, which is coming up in a couple of weeks at the Abraham Lincoln Hotel. And uh, Sandy Wittig, who manages that conference, uh, indicates that we're already at 200 registrations and we have about two weeks to go or three weeks to go. So I think it's gonna be another good event and the um, or useful event. And the conference will have some sessions as well on a recruiting uh, you know, action items or places that have successfully done recruiting. Uh, so just a bit of a background for I don't understand. Um, Nancy's gonna put up a poll where we're, we're asking you uh, if a series of questions, did you attend a first session? Um, you know, what kind of things did you do? What did you learn? And if you'll put those, those comments together, uh, and put them in a chat box or answer a poll, we'd really uh, like to kind of keep track on what impact we're having and how maybe we can adjust the next session if we need to to uh, to better meet your needs. So, so Nancy will uh, take care of that. Just a little bit of background. When you look at rural trends, you really have two perspectives. One is sort of the national perspective where we're seeing that Rural is, you know, shrinking and all kinds of negative things are happening and, you know, will the last person turn out the lights kind of concept. But when you look at that, what's really happening is that as rural areas prosper, then they're basically become urban because they're classified as, as urban by, by the federal government. So when you have that sort of situation, then it's kind of self-determined that rural is going to look like as though it's not prospering. But when you really look at the facts down at, at that's what I, I would consider kind of a macro level. When you look at the micro level though, and you look at individual counties and communities and things, you find that yes, maybe in some cases the population is declining, but the number of housing units is the same or maybe increasing. And Mike covered some, or uh, Ben covered some of that in the earlier session and we'll do some more um, uh, today. But the idea is that when you're looking at the community level, individual community level, level, while your populations are declining, that really means 
that there are some negative things occurring that you need to try to address. And the negative things are like, if you have a smaller population, even though you have more households, what's happening is you have less in the way of motor fuel tax reimbursements or, or state uh, revenue sharing, these kinds of, of activities. So we have to sort of approach this from two levels. One is we have to understand that rural is not on the way out, that in fact, there are a lot of very positive things happening. But the second thing is that from the point of view of our individual communities, we need to take some actions to, to do here to make this, uh, reverse these trends. And the nice thing about it is uh, from the camp pandemic, we basically ended up with some, uh, some additional tools, particularly with uh, being able to do um, more remote working, for example. And so this opens some opportunities for some, not all communities, but for some communities. The idea that with we have um, increases in the, the telecommunications uh, programs, and Illinois has spent a lot of money putting uh, broadband into the rural areas and, and forming groups to kind of work that, that um, broadband, those broadband issues. But you can now have people who want to start their own business in a small community and market over the internet. So in essence, you don't have to be in close proximity to a, um, a metro area. And a third thing that's, I think, important is that we're seeing a, a growing importance as evidenced by the Pew uh, Foundation surveys and others, that people really value the quality of life and, and turn, uh, deciding where to live. They want good schools, they want affordable housing, they want a, a social involvement or social interaction. And these are things that are really opportunities for rural areas. The issue is though, that they're opportunities. They aren't gonna necessarily happen. And so what this set of programs is all about is figuring out ways that you as a community leader or business leader or, or whatever your position can make it happen. So it's really turning opportunities into action items. And that's been really the thrust of the um, of these programs. And we'll do it for the next um, you know, one or two as, as we do these. So uh, our, as I mentioned earlier, our conference um, is coming up in a couple or three weeks in at the um, uh, Abraham Lincoln Hotel in Springfield. So if you haven't registered, well, I would encourage you to do so. I think the program is going to be pretty strong as we um, as we move ahead. So to the point, uh, Ben Winchester is our speaker today, and Ben is a research fellow from the uh, University of Minnesota, Wisconsin, the Center for Community Vitality. And Ben is widely recognized and, and in my mind, a, a valued colleague for his work on um, the brain drain in rural areas, the uh, successful recruiting strategies in Montana, Minnesota, other states. Uh, he's really a, a person who, who has been, been there. He lives in a rural area and he really can speak with authority on these kinds of discussions. So Ben, the microphone is yours. Well, good. Uh, thanks, Norm. Hey, really good to see you all here today. I, I know that like two thirds of you had seen uh, the first session. So welcome back uh, to those of you that had seen me before. Um, for those of you that haven't, I'm sorry you missed it. Uh, you're going to have to change how you talk about your rural communities. Uh, just going to have to trust us that uh, rural is not dying. Uh, our best days are not behind us, that we actually have a lot of people who love living in our rural communities. And so Real celebration for me to be able to do research through the University of Minnesota Extension uh, to share kind of this knowledge about the trends happening across our rural communities and, and our small towns. So um, with that, I've got a PowerPoint because I've got a ton of data to share with you as usual. So um, as, as you may or may not know, I, I, I'm a data geek. I love data. I like to use data to help me understand kind of how the world changes um, because, you know, I, I can't see my kids change day to day, but, you know, one year later, they're two inches higher. So like the data tells me things are changing. So use data to tell you what's going on in the world. So this is session two. Uh, the first session, in case you missed it, we'll do a little bit of backtracking here. Uh, the whole premise behind my life's work is I want to rewrite the rural narrative. And the premise that I've got here is that the narrative we're using to describe our small towns and rural places is terrible. Uh, it's based upon things that happened 100 years ago. And we have very little recognition of kind of all these positive trends that are going on. So we did review many of these positive trends. And uh, that led to this presentation. So we've got rural populations growing. There are people moving in. There is a brain gain trend of people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s moving into just about every rural place in this country. So much so, it filled up our homes. 
And now when we talk about how do we recruit people in in modern day economic development world, um, the traditional model of economic development is industrial recruitment, right? And that's the idea that you want to bring in a business. And when you have a business in town, that'll give a reason for people to move in. It is an employer-based resident recruitment model that there's no other reason people are going to live here unless they have a job. Well, we know from the research that people don't always have a job locally. And you probably know that yourselves. Do you live in the same county you work in? You may commute two counties over. That ultimately the interaction between where we live and where we work is becoming what we call decoupled. They're not as related to one another as they used to be. So um, we're gonna, we are gonna kind of review some of this. And I think uh, during the pandemic, there was a lot of attention paid to rural America. It's like, hey, the pandemic is making city folks think rural. Like for the first time is the idea here when we know it's not, it's ridiculous that this is happening for the first time, but this is the first time a light has truly been shown upon rural communities for in this way, in a positive way. And so you end up with things like, oh, the Heartland Revival. The Heartland's going to be revived because all these people now have awareness that they can live wherever they want. Well, and then when these folks during the pandemic decide to move out and get to our rural communities, they instantly found out that our homes were already filled up. So what happened is it just exacerbated home values. So essentially the few homes that essentially go on the market now have three or more people uh, putting in bids on those or making offers on that home. So a lot of these proclamations coming out of the pandemic that say, hey, isn't this gonna save rural? And my common response is, We've already saved ourselves, thank you very much. And we saved ourselves well before the pandemic. And we're gonna go through some of these things. So um, I kind of, I talk about like, it seems like so long ago, like the, there's the Star Wars thing a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, like before the pandemic, do you remember this? Like, you know, we had a labor shortage. We had a, we had a housing shortage. This was before the pandemic. This is not pandemic related. So with that in mind, kind of returning back to what the normal was before, uh, we know that the rural populations continue to go up. So those of you that saw the first presentation, this is not going to be new to you. We've, we are, this is part of the language, rural's not dying. Our populations have gone up by 11%, but they didn't go up as fast as urban areas did. So it looks like there's fewer people as a percentage that live in our rural communities. Uh, more importantly, I think across in the bottom left corner here, you'll see um, across the state of Illinois, the counties in gray were the counties that were considered urban in 1960 or 1970, right in that time period. But today, the ones in orange have been reclassified. They were rural 50 years ago and now are urban, right? I mean, they looked rural years ago. Now, so many people in the Chicago, what, Springfield, Champaign area, and then the St. Louis um, uh, kind of ring around St. Louis. Like, again, my point from the first webinar is urban areas have not grown taller. They've grown wider, and they've taken over all of these rural, formerly rural places. In fact, 18 of the counties, 18 of your counties have been reclassified from rural to urban since 1974. What happens to the rural data then? It looks like your populations went down. What happens to your urban data? It looks like your population went up because you just took our rural people away and counted them as your urban people now, right? I mean, it's a it's a shell game with data kind of, right? To count like who's rural and who's urban at this point. But really, this is pretty significant. 18. Almost three quarters of a million people now live in places that were rural. And that 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 tells me there's an aspiration, there's a residential desire to actually want to live in these rural places. Otherwise, you would not see rings around any of these urban areas, right? If people wanted urban life, you would just grow taller, but they haven't. All urban areas have grown wider. And the majority of all the metropolitan areas in this country have lost their population. And so now, more recently, the, there's some data that came out um, there's some data that came out recently that showed the rural populations went up again. So during the 2000, 2010s, the rural population went down. And our view is that it went down because our homes are just filled with a lot of older people. And we end up having a what's called a slow trickle. And that is people literally passing away and surviving people staying in towns. And we've had a very slow trickle population away from our rural communities. But there's also, there's also growth where there's death. And this is the common line right now. So I was on Twitter and people are talking about this. Rural populations went up, but it was interesting that the rural populations went up in counties that had high death rates. Well, to be honest, when you have high death rates, that opens up homes. That opens up homes for new people to move in. In fact, when you look at the national map, which I don't have here today, I just kind of created this random map, but it was like, where do we see growth in young homeowners in this country? It's in the center part of the country, the like Great Plains part. They were the oldest counties 25 years ago, but they're also now the ones that have the turnover 
of people soonest. And it's in those places that were the oldest that are now seeing renewal and a growth in the under 45 age cohorts. So with that, our rural populations go up. But a lot of times, as I mentioned earlier, we talk about the brain drain, right? The brain drain is over here. Communities, counties, they lose young people. Grant County, Minnesota here, they lost 43% of their young people after graduation. But meanwhile, on this chart of who moves in and who moves out, if the bar goes to the right, that means people in these age groups are moving in to these rural communities. And where do we see? We see growth in the 30, 40, and 50-year-old cohorts. And there's growth in the 10 to 14-year-old cohorts. This is a group of people that have been consistently moving into our rural communities and moving in since the 1970s. And I'm gonna call this the brain gain. We went over this in pretty good detail in the first webinar, but I'll just go do a quick overview of this. So basically what this is, is I wanna counter that negative narrative. The rural brain drain, I mean, seriously, you're gonna call your town a brain drain town because your 18 year olds are leaving. But meanwhile, you got people in their 30s, 40s and 50s moving in, they're in their prime earning years. They have an education, they have experience, a spouse, a partner, a family at times, right? Why are we using all this negative narrative around losing our 18 year olds? When in fact, we barely recognize that we have these people moving in and have been moving in since the 1970s. In fact, if these people had not moved in, we wouldn't have a housing shortage right now. I mean, this is my main point. We have had a housing shortage for 15 years now in rural America. And it's not because nobody wants to live there. It's because they do, right? Our homes are filled, so. We've done these newcomer studies and we go into communities and we ask, you know, people who moved in in the past five years, like, why did you move to these communities? We've done these studies in Nebraska, Minnesota, Montana, and we ask newcomers, why did you move to the small town? And the top three reasons that people give is number one is a simpler pace of life. Get, you know, there's like push and pull factors at play. One is get away from the commute. Two is access to recreation and nature in closer proximity to where they currently live, number one. Number two is safety and security. It's especially high with people and children. Um, I think we kind of tongue in cheek say, like, if you can put a picture of a kid riding a bike on a city street in your marketing materials for your town, that blows people away. Because if you live in an urban area, there's no way my kid's going to ride on the street, right? But in the rural community, I live in Hancock, like you can have your kid ride across the street and it's right by the school. It's no big deal, right? I mean, you still are concerned for your kids riding your bikes on the street. I'm just saying it is a visual kind of association people have. And then the third top reason that people give is a low cost of housing. Uh, third top reason, we're starting to not see that as an advantage in a lot of places anymore, but it still is a major advantage for our rural communities. So what we had seen is just 41% of new people are moving for a job. When we pointedly asked new people like, hey, Kim, did you move because you had a job or a job offer to this town? 41% said, yeah, I moved because I had a job or a job offer. Put the other way, 60% of new people aren't moving for that job. They're not moving for a job or a job offer. They end up kind of drawing this huge square triangle around like, I want to live between here and here and here. And they explore parks and homes and schools and like all these things in the middle of everywhere. But they don't select that town solely because of where that job is. Of course, they need a job, but that's not the reason why they're moving there. So then we also know, and this is one of my most important points, is the second point here is just 25% of new residents moving to your community are from there, of new households. This blew us away, to be honest. We thought it was going to be like super high, a lot of people returning, meaning they moved, they grew up there, you moved away and you come back, and those are called returnees. Well, that's just one in four people. Three out of four newcomer households to our rural communities are transplants, meaning they're not from there. I mean, they still value the things you value. A lot of people are like, oh, all those new people moving in, they're just gonna change my town for the worse. And it's like, well, actually they have very similar values to you. <laughs> like, I think people would be kind of blown away by how not different people can be. Um, I think, you know, people assume change is always bad. Well, change always happens. And if you don't actually respond to it or manage it, it's gonna change you. So meanwhile, now you've got three quarters of new people moving in and they're not from there. What type of newcomer experience do they have? I'm interested right now in chat, if you have moved to your community in the past even 10 years, how were you welcomed? Were you welcomed in any way to your community? And what did that look like? So if you just over the next like five, 10 minutes, you get a chance to share in there, like what welcoming experiences did you experience personally uh, when you made a move, if you made a move? So 25% lived there before, People who are from that community have a whole different perspective. They've got access to social capital. They know people in town. They know where the jobs are. They know where all the stuff is in the region, right? But if you're new to the region, it can be isolating. It can be lonely. It can be hopeful and opportunistic, but also very anxiety-ridden. 
So um, with that, uh, the last one I want to hit on here is 47% of newcomer households have kids, uh, just half. We thought that was going to be actually a lot higher. So uh, what we do see now during the pandemic, what shifted? People moving for a job goes down because, again, during the pandemic, people are mo moving for remote work. Fewer and fewer people are looking for a job locally because they've already got one. So what does this mean for the dynamics of our local housing market? What does this mean for the dynamics of our local labor market and the inter intersection between the two? <laughs> the percent of people who had lived in the community before went up. Now, this is super interesting because we have found out during the pandemic, a majority of home sales in our smallest communities were not arm's length transactions. Meaning, how do you find a home for sale in our rural communities? You have to actually know somebody. It's like a social network in. People aren't even putting their homes up for sale. It's like, oh, hey, Kim, I know your mom is going to be selling her house. Do you mind if we take you out for a meal? We're just going to buy your house. And it never gets listed. It never gets listed. So meanwhile, people from the outside that actually are interested in moving in, they're looking at like Realtor.com or Zillow and they don't see anything. People are looking for a new superintendent job at your school. And they're like, there's nowhere for me to live. I'll just move on to the next job, I guess. Right. So unless you have a real in the local housing supply, your economic development and everything else is going to be stretched. It is our number one limiting factor. It's why we're the whole third webinar on February 14th is solely going to cover this housing supply and demand model. But meanwhile, we've got resident recruitment. How do you still, when you've got people that want to live and people that are currently moving into your community, because to be honest, people are always moving into your town. Go ask your city clerk. Go ask your property managers. There's always people moving in and always people moving out. It's a churn of things that happen. So unless you can provide an opportunity for your local employers or other networks to get access to homes, it's going to be a real struggle for them to kind of maintain themselves right now through this tight housing supply. So uh, we got a whole list of reasons why people move, but we also know, I, I kind of shared this on the first one, a lot of times we heard uh, newcomers when I would talk about like, hey, you got a bunch of new people moving to your community. And then the local people would be like, what? They're not, I don't believe that. They're not showing up at my meetings. And I'm like, right, they're not showing up at yours. They're showing up at theirs. And you don't even know where they're participating or you know spending their time. So we got to be careful about how we badmouth people that don't show up at my meeting or as if they don't care about the community. Like, okay, how welcoming is our community? This is real. This is a real question here. So meanwhile, we need to recognize how people engage themselves socially too. Then I use nonprofits. I love nonprofits because they reflect who you are. Right, you and you spend your time. You can donate money in your nonprofit sector. It provides a social kind of net. It provides a social supply. It provides a way to invest in your social networks. So when I look at the number of nonprofits in this country, we see the number of nonprofits goes up by ten to fifteen percent in the upper Midwest, up to twenty to twenty five percent in some of these states. And the nonprofits in the southeastern part of the country have went up by over fifty percent. Which initially I was like, what is going on? Like I typically know we're in the upper Midwest here. Our you know voting rates are higher, our home ownership rates are higher, like our social capital numbers are higher. Like, how can the number of nonprofits in the southern part of the country be going up so much faster than we are? I thought we had it going on. While the number of nonprofits in the southern part of the country does grow, there's still nowhere near as many per capita as there are in the upper Midwest. So they're growing, but they're still not even caught up really to where we all are. So my point here is that the nonprofit sector continues to grow. And why is it growing? Because people are creating nonprofits that reflect their interests today. And I had shown uh, this earlier, but you know, the number of nonprofits across Illinois continues to go up. What we had seen between 2010 and 2020, it looks like there's a decline, right? That red bar is the number of nonprofits and it looks like the number of nonprofits went down. But what happened is, in 2011 to 2014, the IRS cleaned up their database. I call it the great cleanse. Like they cleaned up, they had all these like nonprofits that were from 100 years ago on their database, but they weren't around. So they basically, the IRS said, all right, we're going to, you know, these 67,820 nonprofits right here, we're going to send out a postcard to all of them. And all they have to do is return the postcard. Well, 21,000 didn't return the postcard. That's how many nonprofits were in the database. So essentially, when I add them back in now to take out the dead ones, right, now we see the growth trajectory is still growing. Number of nonprofits is still increasing, is still going up. What type of nonprofits do you have? Number one sector of nonprofits classification are religion. You know, churches number one by far in almost every state in this country. Number two, education. Number three, groups, and that might be like, you know, uh, 
basketball groups or 4-H groups, things like that, philanthropy, volunteerism, grant making. I mean, these are strong components of our social infrastructure. But if you look just at the number of, oh, and I think I created one data point here. Like, um, interestingly enough, one in 25 people, when you add together all the local governments, and when you add together all the local nonprofits, I'm interested in kind of calculating this figure of how many people do I need to run my town? was my very first question. I'll put this link in chat when we're done here, but I've got a report on this from Minnesota, Montana. I could do it for Illinois too. But essentially it was like, imagine I, I, lived, I lived in Hancock, like we've got the city council, we've got our EDA, we've got the Lions Club, like we've got six government groups and we've got seven nonprofits. Well, they all need leaders, right? They all need a minimum of three people to sit on a nonprofit. You need, uh, that's an IRS requirement. And then your county might have five people. Your school district has five to seven, somewhere in there, right? And I don't know the specifics of Illinois. But essentially, when you add all of those kind of required leadership positions together, all the nonprofits and all the government leadership positions, you find out that one in 25 people in the state need to serve as a leader in either the government or the nonprofit sector. And I, I haven't done the data yet, but I would argue in rural Illinois, that's going to be like one in 15. One in one person per city block has to serve as a government or nonprofit leader. These type of social expectations can actually dissuade people from wanting to be involved when it looks like, oh man, you only got two people on your board. Like, ugh. like if I show up at your meeting, I'm just going to be shouldering a third of the load now. Ugh, not really interested in that, right? <laughs> I mean, like people want to see a critical mass and feel like there's energy and stuff and not a dying organization. So we know that the organizations, like 54% of all nonprofits in Illinois have been created in the past 30 years. Like this is out with the old, in with the new kind of stuff. We're always creating new groups. And what kind of new groups are we creating? Educational institutions and related groups. Again, that's related to like, it could be parenting groups. It could be youth sports groups. It could be all of these things related to education. Number two sector is philanthropy and grant making. Number three is recreation, sports, leisure, then arts, culture, humanities. I mean, these are all things that make our communities where we love to live, right? We create these nonprofits because we want to do something better for our communities, and we do this work. So meanwhile, at the same time, when you look across at some of these more rural counties like Cass County, again, now remember, you've got this cleanse in here, right? Where the data, you're removing kind of these dead nonprofits. So when you look at this, it's like, oh, there's a reduction in the number of nonprofits in Cass County. When it's not, it's an artifact of the cleanse right in there, right? So in Cass County, there's 38 government positions that are needed. That's county. You can be soil and water conservation folks. You can have township officers. You can have city council people, all of those government positions. You have 38 government entities and you have 80 nonprofits. And of those, when you look kind of at the components of these groups, one of the things I want to point out, and I've got a couple of counties to show here, is that uh, the number of nonprofits, again, you've got that cleanse in between 2010 and 2020. But I want to look at this ratio of the number that file 990 and those that don't. So nonprofits are very active these days. And so this is that person that's like, where, where are these people? If they're not here. They don't care about this community. Well, actually, when you look at all these new groups, they tend to have receipts. So what this line explains, the number filing 990, it's like having to file a full-on tax form. So, you know, like if you're lower income, you can file the 1040 EZ as opposed to the full 1040. Well, um, and at the bottom here, I don't know if you can see it there, it's under my, I can't really see it myself, but if your organization has gross receipts of $50,000 or more, then you have to file the full tax form. You can't file the 1040 easy, you gotta file the full tax form. So when you look at the number filing full 990s, 63 out of the 80 nonprofits are now having receipts of more than 50,000 or more. This is quite significant. You have a larger number of nonprofits filing full 990s, which means they're economically viable, right? And at the same time, look at the lines below that. The revenue of these organizations have went up from 3.8 million in 2000, almost doubled in 2020. Like that's well exceeding the rate of inflation. I love this line right below that, which is assets, because assets are things that are kind of a community characteristic. These nonprofits are vehicles of social investment. I can invest in the nonprofit sector and get returns socially from it. So meanwhile, you see that the assets of this nonprofit sector goes up too. And that population per organizational role at the bottom here, right below me, uh, is 15. That means one in 15 people in Cass County need to serve as a nonprofit or government leader. Clinton County, same kind of story. You're going to see that cleanse in there. So it looks like a reduction. 
we look at the proportion, like, I mean, they went from almost tripled the number of nonprofits that are filing full 990s that have, again, receipts of 50,000 or more, higher proportion, right? The revenue has gone up well exceeding the rate of inflation. The assets almost doubled, like almost every 10 years. And one in 22 people in Clinton County need to be involved as a leader in the nonprofit or government sector. Scheuler, <laughs> same story here. Now, 78 of the 95 nonprofits are filing full 990s. The revenue has been steady, still growing, right? And then the nonprofit, the, sorry, the assets of the nonprofit sector has doubled again in the past 10 years. And here, uh, very uh, significant, uh, the, the demand for leaders in this county, one in eight, one in eight people have to serve as a nonprofit or government leader. I can't even tell you how stressful this is on your local infrastructure. Like you go to you go to groups and like, you know, you can't even leave a board unless you find your replacement. So like, how are you going to find your replacement when people are so tapped out? And these implications are huge because what if you want to start a new organization? What if you want to hold a new event in town? You do it, nobody shows up. And then you're like, oh, this community doesn't care about it. Well, they do. They're so tapped out. You're so tapped out. So there's tons of work to be done here around bridging these groups together, getting them to work better together, to recognize trends like this in general, to see that there's a competition for your leaders, for your time, for your volunteers. So at the same time, you've had people, these newcomers moving in and enjoying social life. Uh, they're diversifying the economy, too, you know, and. I went over this, I'll go over this briefly here, but really what we had found is there's a narrative around the, the industry kind of related to rural is always agriculture, right? It's rural is agriculture. And it's like, oh my God. Well, 95% uh, of rural people are not engaged in ag or an ag related field. In fact, the largest industries in rural America today are education and health services. By far, they make up a third of all our jobs, eds and meds. It's kind of what they call it, the eds and meds economy, right? But it's caring for people. This is what we do. So our message here is, you're right. Any one town, Hancock, you don't have a diverse economy. You don't have jobs in all these different sectors and all these different occupations, right? True. But when you put five to seven rural counties together, you, say, you find the same diversity in the economy, the same diversity in occupations that you find in our urban area, only you have to like look to your neighbor to it. Like my town isn't gonna have it. I have to be okay with Benson down the road having the electrical engineer jobs and me not having them. And even though people may still wanna live in Hancock and they're gonna commute down every day. They're gonna, this is the model. There's a disassociation between where we choose to work and where we choose to live. We also know that people are telecommuting. A full on 20% of newcomer households were telecommuting. I have 21% uh, of households that have a member that telecommutes in some way. And this was before the pandemic. So now into the pandemic, we know those numbers are probably going to be quite a bit higher. But we we have shifted like our economy. And I mentioned this in the first one, especially like our our small towns look different. You know, you might have a boarded up gas station, a boarded up bank building and like these artifacts of the past. But ultimately, we have shifted our economy more to regional centers. Right. You know this across the state. People are commuting in, commuting out. The growth is in the regional centers. We have something called mega regions that Dartmouth does, which looks at commuting patterns about how far do people go out. I mean, it's bonkers when you look at some of this across the state, how far people go. Like this transportation aspect of rural living is just part and parcel of how we live our life. So when you look at uh, like, oh, shoot, did I have some of the data here? I didn't get the Cass County data. Um, but in Calhoun County, just 20 every day. So how to interpret these maps? These are called on the map maps. And it means every day, 261 people commute in. Every day, 1,500 people commute out of the county. And just 512 people live and work in the county. Just 25% live and work in the county. Cass County, 3,200 people commute in every day. 3,700 people commute out and just 2,600 people live and work. I mean, overall in Minnesota, the number, I didn't do the number for Illinois, but in Minnesota, just 51% of people of work in the county they live in, just, just half. Like we're commuting out all the time. But another way to interpret this is our county boundaries really don't mean very much. Our county boundaries were drawn during a time of horse and buggy. They don't reflect like how people live. But meanwhile, you've got to make decisions in them and be like, our county has meaning here. So how do you make these jurisdictional matters um, matter uh, in a way for the people that live there? So we'll go through a few more of these. Edgar County, again, 3,300 every day. I mean, it's almost equal numbers across the board, but just half of people both live and work in the county. 
Gallatin County, just 461 people live and work. That's 23%. Hardin, 28% live and work. Marshall, just 23% both live and work. Right. And what are the implications here? Because a lot of times, like imagine like every day in Marshall County, 1700 people commute in. But think about this. A lot of times I work with communities and we do community visioning projects. Like what's your vision for the future of your community? And who do we typically include in that? The people who live there. Well, every day you got 1700 people that are commuting in and really call this place their home, too. Right. Are they ever given a voice? What about your recreational property owners? Do they have any voice in the future? Like, why do we put such primacy on the people that just live here or the people that just work here from the employer perspective? So there's an intermix in a relationship between them, but there's also a disconnection that we've seen between them. And we'll get this PowerPoint shared with you if you want to look at these. If you're interested in any of the data for your county, shoot me an email and I can get one generated for you uh, fairly quickly. So really, we live in a regional community. We live beyond our individual town. We live in this vast region uh, that I call living in the middle of everywhere, right? It's, <laughs> it goes against that negative narrative that we live in the middle of nowhere. Then actually, you live in the middle of everywhere. So we actually, I'm going to just share with you briefly, like we do this exercise in extension that says like, hey, all right, so we're going to hand out a map of your region. And then we ask people, let me see if I can get this here. So I live in Hancock and I work in Morris. So put a star where you live and an X where you work and another X where your partner or spouse may work, right? My wife worked in, in Morris too. So really we lived in one place, we work in another. And then think about, and we do this exercise in extension. We hand out a piece of paper with your map that goes about two hours out and people draw these boundaries. And we ask them, draw the boundary. Where in the past year did you go to shop and eat out? And it's probably, just so you know, from St. Cloud right above me to Morris, way on that side, is probably an hour and a half. It's probably 90 miles, just to give you some scope in there. So like in the past year, like we lived in Hancock and we had um, Buddy's Bar and Grill in Hancock, right? Good bar and grill, a great place to eat. But that doesn't mean I wanted to eat at Buddy's every time we ate out, right? <laughs> I want to go to Benson and the Alexandria and Wilmer. Like we have all these places to go. And that's part of the point. We don't have to have it all because everybody else has part of it all in the mix of this middle of everywhere model. So when you draw these boundaries out, you find out some very interesting things. So the first thing you do is have people draw their boundary around how far in the past year did you go to shop and eat out? And then draw another boundary around how far did you go to play and recreate? And like um, Canada up to the, like, I mean, so far north, it's like four hours to the north here, right? Or uh, down to the south where I go you know, over by Ortonville on the west side there, I'll go fishing on Orton and Big Stone Lake over in that area. So it's like, how far of a region do you live in? And what you end up doing out of this, um, I wonder what I've got for the next slide here. Now, I mean, but generally what you find is the difference between where people, obviously, between where people live and work can be up to 45 minutes. The difference between where people live and how far they go to shop and eat out is an hour. And then if, between where people live and where they play is hours away. And you know this. So now one of the other things we like to do is in one corner, and I think I had this on the earlier slide. Let me jump back to this. In one, uh, oh, I didn't really hear, but in one corner, it says that here, age range. So in one corner up here, I'll say, what's your age? And a lot of people don't like to give their exact age. So I'll just give me your age range, right? In 30s, 40s, or 50s, whatever. So I'll put in my age range, 50s. And then in the top right corner, there's a box. And in that box, it says list three, list three to five of your favorite assets. Now, and these aren't like nebulous things, like hardworking people. Like, I mean, a real park. Give me a real park or a brewery that I like to go to. Like real assets. And what you do, I sort these out by age. If you imagine, if you did this kind of map for everybody in your town and you put them around in a room and you sorted them by age, you would find that as people get older, their everywhere gets bigger because you get more like familiar with the region you live in and where to go and things to do. Your everywhere gets bigger. So it's like 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and then your dot will go away at some point. So, but then you get, right, that's your everywhere. And then what you also notice is that the assets that the people identify on the younger side are vastly different than the assets people are identified on the 70 year old side. So how do you find out about new things? How do you talk about things that, you know, somebody may like when I'm not their age? When I'm not, I don't have an affinity with their group, how do I talk about this place in a way that's still positive when I don't know what who they are or what they enjoy or things like that? So 
there are some really deep implications here around marketing. How do you market yourself when you have to ultimately market your neighbors? What about transportation people? Like they've already known all this, uh, but really it plays into our employee and resident recruitment model. And my main point here is how do you make decisions locally when the region is the primary unit of interest? Like how do you ask the mayor? It's like, hey, Molly, you know, you're the mayor of Hancock. I'm looking to move into Hancock. I love this town. And you're like, oh, you're going to love Hancock. Right. Like we've got Buddy's Bar and Grill. We got a full K-12 school. We have a C-store slash car sale slash deli slash hair cutter on the corner. And I was like, it's going to be great. And I say, well, I'm also looking at moving to Benson, you know. And then the mayor's like, oh, you don't want to move to Benson. They got nothing going on there. It's all here in Hancock. This is where you want to live. Now, what did you just do? Not only did you downplay your neighbor. But now you really do live in the middle of nowhere. You can't name off anything around me that I might actually enjoy to do. Like, I, you really do live in the middle of nowhere. So this is where we have to get past our parochialism and talk nicely about our neighbors. And maybe their sports teams are okay. Or maybe you can still, you know, you know, be competitive on their sports team. But end it there, right? So really, it's the chicken or egg of economic development. Uh, traditionally, we look at employer-based resident recruitment. That is industrial recruitment, which is the only reason people are going to move into my community is because they have a job, right? The chicken is the job and the egg is the person, I guess. So then like, sometimes it's the other way, though, right? It's now people can bring their jobs. So jobs are the attraction for new residents. And the idea here around traditional employer-based resident recruitment is nobody would ever move here without a job. That's not true today, especially. It actually it has been true in like 30 years. I mean, this whole idea of commuting out and transforming our rural economy to be regional, this is not new. We should already recognize this to some extent. I'm surprised we don't. We've been talking about regionalism since the moment I entered this career of rural development, and I still have yet to see communities really do a good job of it because we're still really competitive. We're competitive between our counties and our cities, and for what reason, right? So, Getting back to the, you guys had seen this um, uh, at the last one, but in our newcomer survey, we asked newcomers, like, do you believe the community you moved to was welcoming? And a full 78% of new residents say the community is welcoming. But if you break it down by another question, which is, do you see yourself living here in five years? And right, so we're not going to actually follow up with them in five years. But for those people that said the community was welcoming, strongly agree up there, 86% of people are like, oh, yeah, I'll be here in five years. But if people, for the people at state, the community is not welcoming, they strongly disagree that the community is welcoming. Now, 44% are like, I'll be here. But more importantly, 56% are like, I don't think I'm going to be here. Now you have a retention issue. Now your employer should care because your community matters. This is all the model of resident recruitment now. We're finding out that people will not stay in the community, that the job is not enough. So we want to talk about a resident recruitment model, which is involved with community development, economic development, and tourism. And why we include tourism in this is important. It's because we've done this uh, research in Minnesota called the halo effect. And part of this says that when, when visitors to your community have a positive experience, they are more likely to see your place as a good place to live, start a career, study, buy a business. But imagine their narrative is negative. Their communications are negative. The, I told the story last time about you go into a gas station in a small town and you ask people what's fun to do. And the number one answer you get is nothing because who's working there? Like some high school kid. And they're like, oh, what narrative are you telling to your visitors? We know that tourism is a direct line equation to full-time residency. 54% of second homeowners plan to retire to their second home when they, or plan to move to their second home when they retire. But meanwhile, there's a narrative out there about our, you know, second homeowners, these lake people or whatever that are only here on the weekend. They don't really care about this town and then they're not invited to anything. But meanwhile, then when these people do move up to their second home, they're looking around to the community like nobody invites me to anything. I'm not invited to any school functions, like nothing. How are these people actually welcomed in? Do you even know where these new people are? How do you track them? So Resident recruitment in our model has is, is got to be coordinated. You coordinate community and economic development actions needed to identify, attract, and invite new residents in. And our key motto here is we're working on the life-work balance. It's not work-life because that implies work is still first. We're on the life-work balance model. So what does this look like? How do you invite people into your town? Graduations, class reunions. These are the low-hanging fruit, right? That's the re potential returnees. Um, you can also go to your tourism locations. But again, your narrative matters. Like, you better talk about your place like a place people like. Uh, or why would anybody ever want to move to your place? If you've got a dying narrative, um, it's going to be real hard to recruit people in. 
There are opportunities to bring people in. Media, Facebook, Google Ads, they're all very targeted. They're very effective at kind of targeting these, uh, these people looking to move to. But more importantly, a lot of times you can invite people in just by lifting up the voice of all the new people moving in already. Uh, so we've got a, 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 one of our um, social media experts in Minnesota, like all they do is retweet visitors in their region and their visitors like, man, I'm like seeing here. I feel like I'm part of the community digitally apart, right? They're physically there and digitally connected to the leadership in the county. So there's a way to lift up the voice of new newcomers, because a lot of times if you've got a negative narrative in town, you can talk to a newcomer. And their narrative is not negative. As I mentioned the last at the end of the last session, nobody moves to your town for pity. People are moving into your towns for hope and opportunities. You should hear what they have to say about your communities. So your narrative matters here. What about incentives? We hear about this. We got to pay people, right? Isn't that what we got to do? Like Tulsa Remote, they pay people $10,000. If you've got a remote job, you can move into Tulsa, right? For small towns, it's probably not viable to pay people $10,000. You're going to have a lot of resistance to that. But meanwhile, our towns do have things like land. We give away land or utility waivers or tax credits. But what we found in our research is when everybody offers free land, it's not really an incentive anymore. And in fact, we found a majority of the land kind of give away land and you know you don't have to pay for water or sewer hookups or whatever it is. Like a majority of the transfers that happened on these land incentives happened with existing residents that just moved over to a new house. It wasn't even bringing in new people. So essentially all your local people were just like subsidizing a family to move from one place to another in town. <laughs> so anyway. Uh, you do other things like, you know, down payment assistance, moving assistance, cash sometimes, right? There's communities that give out bicycles and park passes as a, as a value statement, right? It's a value statement when you make that. And then offering co-working spaces too, especially on the economic side, you've got to advertise that on the front end. So I like to talk about incentives here because, you know, there's a public service uh, program nationally too, that if you get a job in the private or in the public sector as education or government, that you can actually have student loans waived after a number of years, right? So a lot of times, if you have community incentives, you can be stacking other incentives on top of that. So if you're a coupon cutter, and I know there's like coupon cutter people out there, like you can stack coupons, right? I got a 20% and I can stack a 20% on top of that, which normally it's just one coupon at a time, whatever. Well, actually resident recruitment, you can kind of stack your coupons. If you've got local incentives, you can build, there might be a statewide program to incentivize doctors, lawyers, and other things to come into your community. So if you're offering that together with that, together with a, a lawyer job in the government, then they've got an eligibility for private, for loan, loan forgiveness. So I think there's a, having a knowledge of the different ways in which people can be supported financially uh, within our communities is important for you to know when you're doing the recruitment. Uh, broadband is mega important. The narrative matters super strong here because the idea is that the, uh, the common rural narrative is that we don't have any broadband. <laughs> you do. You've got fiber across your rural communities. It's not everywhere, but the narrative cannot be one of nothingness. It cannot be that rural areas do not have broadband. In fact, I we've got a network of co-ops and we've got these upper Midwest. You've got them there too. But ideally the same uh, co-ops that developed phone and internet or the phone and electricity for our rural communities are now providing fiber. We had federated telephone in Hancock. And they, they again put in phone systems years ago, but now put in, and they put in fiber to the farm. So the idea here is that if you've got broadband, you've got to put that right up front because people are actually looking for that. They want to know both upload and download speeds. You've got to know both of them. It's not just, oh, we have internet. People are way more astute than that these days. So if you don't know how to talk about broadband, upstream, downstream, you, and really market this in a viable way, people are going to look past your community. But more importantly, rural Illinois has a terrible narrative because, again, they fall right into the digital divide. And the idea here is that when you're looking at a rural community, they don't have any broadband. It's just not true. So we've got to maybe do a clearer job of communicating the programs that we've got available. You've got them available um, across the state to help develop that, in, that, uh, that digital infrastructure for our rural communities. What about economic supports in town? Remote worker beyond kind of broadband, right? Remote worker training. This is a big one. We had seen a lot of rural uh, managers not really understand, understand how to manage a remote workforce. They have no idea. So you have people moving in who might be good remote workers, but my boss knows nothing about measuring my time or measuring my performance. He's like, just uh, get in the office. You can't remote work anymore. Like, what did you just do? You just took away the life work balance from that person. So I think there's a lot of interesting ways to think about how we train up 
not just our people, but our employ, but our managers in how to be a good remote worker. I, I honestly, folks, I relate this very similarly to back in the day when we had to teach people how to use Word and Excel and email, right? I mean, it's very, but using, doing remote work is different. You, you have to have build in accountability measures. You can do this with like Microsoft Teams. Well, anyway, there's tons of different opportunities there, but your managers actually need to know that this is an option too. Child care, huge. Uh, we know it's half of the newcomer households have kids. Not all of them do, but half do. And they're going to need child care too. So imagine if you're part of the three quarters of new people who are not from there and you don't know anyone. And then what if you need emergency daycare? Like, who do you go to? You don't know anybody. What type of network do you have for support? Like this gets back to the welcoming experience. What type of a support system do you have in place to help these new people feel as though they're going to be successful here? Self-employment support. Business succession programs matter a lot here. Like we've got, I think it was like 54 or 56% of the business owners are gonna plan of rural business owners plan to retire in the next like 10 years, 10 to 15 years. Well, uh, if you have a negative narrative, like I'm not gonna buy your dying business. Like, why would I buy a business in your town? You're all dying. Like, oh no, we're not. In fact, the businesses we have in rural America today are stronger than ever. They went through the 2009 recession and we're still here. Like this, this can't be stated high enough again, but if you've got a negative narrative, people don't want to do anything. Why would people make a single investment in your town? If it's your dying town, I'm not going to give you money for water or sewer economic development. Why would they give you anything? So spousal employment matters here too. And regional housing inventory. And I want to talk about there's a tension with housing here because right now, if you've got employers in town who are like, Hey, I've got five jobs right now that I can't fill because there's no housing. And then mm -hmm. Uh, the economic development organization is offering remote work incentives, like to bring in all these remote workers. Well, all they're doing now is competing over my finite number of homes. And is the th are the three homes that are going to go on the market this month going to be filled for my jobs or are they going to be filled through my economic development strategy to bring in remote workers? So you can actually be shooting yourself in the foot to your local employers if you're like playing up one aspect too much. Because again, our housing supply is limited. But the key is when we do have people move in, They've got to feel welcomed. We want to retain them. And this is where we need, need to get past the warm body approach of economic development saying we just need to fill our jobs. Because if that's your attitude, you're in the 44% that aren't going to be here in five years, right? You are actually trying to find a fit for our residents in the community here. So how do you welcome people in? Uh, right away, I'll tell you, your real estate agents, your property managers, and your city clerks know exactly who just moved in. There are always people moving in and out. You can have a frontline training program. So I mentioned about the gas station or the grocery stores who might have a negative narrative by their employees on the front line that talk to people in the public. Maybe there's an opportunity to have a frontline narrative training program or a concierge service. Um, we do a lot. We do have a whole program in the University Extension called a Welcoming Communities Program. And that is really uh, looking at how do we involve people, engage people, and, and, uh, and just create these environments through which people actually want to survive and thrive in, in our rural communities. Now, you can do very simple things. Uh, Otter Tail County, Minnesota, uh, actually, they, they're, we've been building on this brain gain research for a while here in Minnesota. And Otter Tail County, they have the nation's first, it's called a resident uh, rural rebound coordinator is what they call this position. The rebound their town, they're actually doing okay. Um, but what he implemented in Otter Tail County is it's a fairly large county, but every city has an ambassador. And every time uh, uh, a new makes that person only got one rule, and it's the Ben Winchester rule, which you can't ask for. Like, you're just in city on that, like, or is a spot on the Lions Club, or hey, I've got a bunch of raffle tickets. So you can ask them for anything, folks. Like, just, just there for them. Okay. So I'll just, I'll just end up with that. The last thing is a newcomer supper. We call this the best $150 ever spent. And it's not all the new people. It is only for newcomers. And so what the number one outcome out of this newcomer meal is newcomers saying, oh, and away. And how many, if you go out and actually invited all the people in your town that moved in the past five years, you'd be blown away at those numbers, right? So part of this is just a recognition that things always change. And I want these people to be part of our community. 
So we do have to involve people. We got make it home programs. Just involvement starts with a small request. And again, I'm at Molly. We're going to be flipping burgers for the fireman on Friday. Do you mind if you join us? You know, we might meet a few people. It's that simple. It's that small of a request. It's join us, not sit up. Meanwhile, we've got all these recruitment issues across the state. We've been doing this for quite a while. We have almost a dozen resident recruitment issues, all super cool and get rural, the good life. Um, so they're all very, they all do very different things. There is no well-worn for resident recruitment as an outcome in your marketing. Uh, really, just for me, learn about newcomers in your community. What do they say about your town? What do they like? What could be improved? And consider that some visitors to your, to your community might be looking for all this stuff right now. And how do they ever find any of this information either now or when they get there? So uh, Gideon Stude says real clearly in the Harris polls more recently, reiterate that Americans want to live in small towns and rural places. This study from 13 years ago that 51% of Americans prefer to live. So why don't they argue the narrative for many people is so negative? They think they never could. Like, I'm not a farmer. I, you know, I thought you were dying. Why would I move out to your town? Right? All of these things. So uh, in a couple of weeks here, we're going to have a final webinar on housing. We're going to talk about why is our housing stock so stopped up and why do we have a labor shortage? It's one and the same for me. So we'll talk about the supply and demand of rural leadership in two weeks. Um, and with that, I appreciate any feedback. We'll go through comments here, but I know we're running a bit behind. Uh, hopefully, if you've got time to stick around for questions, uh, I'll be here. So uh, again, just I really appreciate the opportunity to share all this here at Extension. We love the ability to bring out all this applied research to the public and hopefully inform our small towns that you can do something about change. Be active, be proactive, and be engaged. Thanks. Thanks, Mike, for or, uh, Ben, for a great presentation again, as usual. A couple of comments. The uh, Otter Tail uh, County experience will be on the conference in, in two, week, two or three weeks in Springfield. So um, that person will do a presentation as, as well as, um, uh, I think it's Mattoon in Motion, which has also a... Um, a recruitment strategy that's been fairly successful. So if you're interested in continuing these kinds of discussions, those would be two, uh, two great sessions to go to. I was impressed with um, a couple of things here. One is the, uh, the wide variety of experiences that the people in the chat box had indicated. Some people said they were welcomed and all kinds of positive things happened. Several people said they didn't really happen. And so, so it's, you know, keep up those kinds of conversations. I think will really help Another one is the regional marketing. And I think in my years of experience, um, you basically, there, it's been very difficult to overcome the idea that, well, when I was younger, I played football against the neighboring community and you know we've never resolved those issues. And that, that sounds silly, but in fact, it's very real in many cases. So developing a regional market is, um, is some, some significance. Um, someone, Molly, I think indicated that um, uh, should, what is the regional conference I'm talking about? It's um, in it's February 23rd and 24th in Springfield. And I think that um, Ann or somebody had put in a, a reference to it. Or Susan just sent a reference to it. So it's in your chat box. If you're interested in registering, it's um, it's it's there. Um, a couple of other things that um, I have, I'm not seeing a lot of questions in the uh, chat box other than um, one of them was how, isn't this more difficult uh, trying to, to welcome newcomers when you have remote workers? Or even when you have workers, the younger people who literally are working out of town. So they're, you know, they're leaving town at eight o'clock in the morning and they're maybe getting back at six o'clock at night and they have, you know, kid responsibilities and all those kinds of activities. So how do you resolve that sort of issue? How do you engage them? Um, because they're kind of a special group and maybe a growing group. Yeah, it's still personal relationships. I mean, change happens at the speed of relationships in our small towns. It is really uh, the individual visits. We do hear about this. I mean, it kind of relates to our leadership stuff too about free riders. Like when people don't have time to actually serve, like how can they still contribute or how can they feel as though they're still engaged when they don't actually have the time to do that? Like, and then we don't want to judge them because they're working out of town and coming in all the time. So it is, how do you provide these opportunities for small engagements or connections? And so it is, it is the very simple things on the week 
weekends, like, hey, we're going to flip burgers. Are you interested in meeting a few people? It is very slow. It is not just bring people right up to speed as to what's going on in town. Like this takes years to kind of develop those relationships and those networks. So once you find the people, um, it, it, uh, the hardest thing is actually like trying to get the list together. And like, how do you find the people? Again, the city clerks, the property managers and that. So you've got these people moving in. They may not feel connected. I see in the, in the chat, like you're kind of there. You've made it work. <laughs> kind of like that's not the ideal welcoming, making it work. Um, probably not the ideal situation for a new resident. So what can you do to learn from the experiences of the people that already went through it? And how could you improve the processes for the ones that are going through it now? I think the box on your front door is not a way to go that some random stranger just drops off a basket with coupons. Like that's not personal at all. So it is like, how do you, how, you just have to talk to people and you have to ask them. You know, it is that simple. So AML, you, you won't be told no unless you ask, right? Uh, you don't know unless you ask whether the people want to actually do something with you. But I think the expectations are very high. Um, I, I, consistently get asked like when are these new people going to learn about my town as if that's a separate thing right and am I and I was like I don't know in a year or two when they're less anxious about trying to figure out their own life like they will come to appreciate where your town has been but it's not going to be right away so what does that look like how can you ensure that the new people moving in are seen and recognized and, and you don't have to set those expectations for engagement so high like I need you to serve on the board or I need you to donate it's just a simple recognition of where they are and what they do. And just another, we have an example, just a low hanging fruit here on the public side is we, we've had newspapers do a brain gain corner and they interview a new resident every week, a new household every week. And they just kind of put that out there. It keeps it in front of the community that we're always changing. There are always people moving in and out. Does your leadership reflect that? Right. That's a huge question. Does your leadership have the same kind of attributes as the broader community? May or may not. One of the uh, questions or uh, comments came up, which I think is, I think is very appropriate. Uh, Dr. O from uh, Governor's Royal Affairs Council mentioned um, that uh, the, the challenges may be even more in the future as we have people with different cultures, different languages, different ethnic backgrounds, how to somehow assimilate them into the more rural communities. And certainly we've seen a major influx of special groups in Iowa and in Illinois too, for that matter. But um, just any comment on that? We're almost out of time, so. Yeah, no, I, I think we all, upper Midwest here, especially a majority of our rural, smallest rural communities don't have a lot of diversity yet, uh, right? It's mostly in these regional centers that it might have food processing and things. And so I get, you know, to be honest, like we, we've we got time to do it right. There's, you know, we, we've got experiences doing it wrong too. I think this is, we, we went through change in our communities already where we went from like the German communities and the Scandinavians moved in and somehow that we made that work. And then the, you know, Protestants moved into our Catholic town and we made that work. But now it's much more visually apparent. As a sociologist, this is interesting because now the people moving in actually look different, right? You can't tell if somebody was, German or Protestant or what? I mean, you can't eat all that, but because there's still a white person moving in. But now, and I get told pretty consistently, like, oh, we would welcome anybody in. Well, not really. Like, uh, you don't you don't know how it's going to go in your community as a whole. And I'm told many times that, you know, we don't have a, you know, a racism issue. And a lot of times, like, you don't have issues until you have diversity. Like, <laughs> not yet, I would say. So there's, there's I mean, it's it's hard to know what's gonna arise out of that. So we've got time to be smart about this and understand when change happens, there are gonna be hurdles. There are gonna be challenges to the existing and the new populations. But we have found that the continued voice of these new residents to build upon one another, build that kind of feeling of belonging and togetherness. And so rather than assimilating people in, I talk about the stew. So rather than everybody kind of being mixed together in the melting pot, I'm about the stew because the melting pot implies there's nothing about you that's going to exist. And you just got to melt into whatever we are in this city today, which isn't even what you were before. So part of this is ensuring that the stew continues to be stirred and that you're going to have pieces removed from the stew and pieces added into the stew. And what does that look like then? when it comes to leadership? What does that look like when it comes to how our businesses treat new people or offer new products? So we've got time, because again, this change is happening very slowly. You'll hear this in two weeks, that we've got a lot of change coming. Two thirds 
of your housing units are going to turn over in the next 20 years, 15 to 20 years. Like this is unprecedented. So how welcoming is it for your towns? Some places it's going to be three quarter of your housing is going to turn over. So we've got time to do this. Do it right. Be okay with missteps. At least we're trying. The real issue is you need to actually work together to do this. If you, you know, the world's going to be changing whether you want it to change or not. Uh, the real differentials from one community to, to another is how well are you working together? Those that work together have better outcomes. Those that don't, do not. It's that straightforward. I agree 100%. Uh, one comment, and then I'll turn it back to um, to Nancy. She wants to do some housekeeping about uh, evaluating the program. But um, Chris Merritt and I recently edited a book on uh, rural areas and transition, meeting challenges and making opportunities. Ben has a chapter in that book, as do a bunch of other people. But it pretty much uh, talks about examples of places that, in fact, have taken advantage of those opportunities and made it happen. So you know, we can send you a flyer on that if you're interested. I'm not trying to sell books, but basically it, it does cover a lot of the different types of strategies. So Nancy, did you wanna finish up? I thought you wanted to put sort of a, a, a session on what did you learn from the program or some sort of a poll, but if not, um, I guess not. Well, thank you very much for coming. We're a few minutes over, but um, really appreciate all your attendance. And we ended up with um, right around 100 people. So um, at the end, up to 140, I think, during the middle part of the program. So thanks very much. And hopefully you'll see in two weeks and we'll try to finish up with housing. So talk to you later. Thanks, everybody.